Thank you very, very much indeed. Now I open the debate. Friends, the, f the floor is yours. So, if you would allow me perhaps to ask a first question. Uh, well, I found uh, your speech very eloquent, and yet it makes me feel a bit awkward because you've really pinpointed our helplessness, our universal helplessness, because this path that you mentioned between the Eurosceptics and the Euro-nationalist is very hard to define and hard to describe. We can have faith in Europe as we do in humankind, but oftentimes we seem to just be preaching in the desert. We have elections coming up. We all expect that they will culminate in disaster, and uh, this is most disheartening. So, well, we have to contend with this reality. We have not succeeded in training and educating at least an elite that could carry forward this message. And uh, I think uh, elections are often uh, used to political advantage. Many Europeans do not understand at all the role of the parliament, the various tools that are available but uh, that are misused, flouted. And we just have failed in our mission to explain uh, to the public at large what can be achieved and what would be the best use of such mechanisms. So what do you think we could do to be as effective as possible rather than just deploring the current situation and finding it disheartening tangibly? What exactly could we do? What could we consider doing to take advantage of the next six months, which is of course a very short period, uh, but we do have six months to, to act. So what would you advise us to do? Well, if we can at least agree on the, the idea that I was trying to expand on the fact that European identity is post-national and what we need to show is that this post-national democracy can function, can be successful. So if we assert this, if we make this claim, that would already be a huge stride forward and it's very challenging uh, in the public forum. Let us take the example of François Hollande, the French president. I don't know whether you voted for him or not. I called on people to vote for him. Uh, that can happen to anyone. And in a, an article or an essay in the Monde, he spoke of France uh, on the horizon of 2025. And if you look at uh, Google, and if you uh, search for Europe, well, you'll find that he didn't mention Europe even once. Which means that even today, senior political officials uh, look at the future, but they only think of it as the national future. Now, if that could be uh, successful, then why not? But, well, my starting point is the fact that we need to think out of the box, we need to offer new novel solutions and proposals. In 30 years, perhaps no single European state will still be a member of the G8, not even Germany. So either we want to regain some sovereignty as we deal with uh, globalization, but this sovereignty can no longer be national. Uh, because of the international trends and uh, globalization, or like Marie Labelle, you could say, well, let's give up the euro, let's no longer be part of Europe, let's shut our borders, and that will solve all our problems. And sometimes I think, uh, rather childishly, well, she should, uh, we should entrust her uh, with power uh, for six months, and that will cause a revolution within a very short time. But of course, that won't happen. But the problem is that no one or very, very few politicians actually tell the truth to their citizens. Democracy, in other words, the sovereignty of citizens, uh, can only be conquered again thanks to Europe. Otherwise, well, the markets and multinational undertakings will, in fact, uh, monopolize power. 
And it's not necessary to be liberal, to be a socialist, to uh, think this way. Adam Smith was not exactly a uh, leftist. He was one of the founding fathers of liberal thought. But why did he feel that the state is so important? Because of the impact of markets and globalization has completely dismantled uh, democracy in its traditional sense. And that is why the EU today really has a duty, after having fostered peace and achieved stable peace, has a duty to now face up to the phenomenon of globalization and tell its citizens you're quite right to be afraid and anxious uh, facing globalization. It's true that uh, Europe may not have an ideal policy. That's quite true. But neither do nation states. Nothing is really working today. It's true that European policy is far from ideal. It's an intergovernmental policy. You have a European budget that is defined by a unanimous decision. Well, imagine already you can see how difficult it is for Congress to adopt the U.S. budget. But just imagine what would happen if the 50 governors of the 50 states would have to take a unanimous decision to adopt the budget in the U.S. There would never be a budget. It would just be impossible. Unanim unanimous decisions, in fact, spell the end of democracy or are tantamount to permanent blackmail. This whole concept of post-national democracy transcending national boundaries, that's an idea that has not yet been assimilated by most political uh, players. And this was true four years ago during previous elections. Uh, it's always the same thing. We were uh, warned that populist movements would hold sway. But that's not true. And uh, at the time already, we were bold. We were bold enough to speak of a European-wide project and speak about li life in a functional Europe could be very gratifying, more gratifying than life in countries that are isolated and uh, are suffering the consequences of globalization. You could suggest, for example, for the European budget, not 23% as in the US, but at least 5% of GDP. If you had 5% of B GDP, uh, 100 billion in the European Investment Bank, that would give you leverage multiplied by 10, and that would be tremendous stimulus for Europe. And no single country acting alone could achieve this. However, the European budget could achieve this. So there are prospects for renewed growth. But it means we have to re-examine our approach to industry. We can't continue to uh, tirelessly defend all uh, brands of national cars, Peugeot, Renault, Volkswagen, Seat. You can't do so simply because, well, European citizens are currently, they aren't buying as many cars, and you can't adopt legislation that will compel every family to buy three cars just to save the automobile industry. So you have to really think out of the box. You have to have innovative projects, innovative industrial projects. When people lose their jobs, well, you have to ask yourselves, is this uh, or was this a job of the future or a job of the past? We have to manage transition. And well, if we speak about the bonnet rouge and what's happening in Brittany, well, they are demonstrating it's just it's very similar to the demonstrations that took place uh, in Chile uh, against Allende and made it possible for uh, the military junta to uh, topple the government. But we do, of course, need to save jobs. And France has just recently decided to uh, build these gigantic farms comprising let's say, at least a 1,000 heads of cattle. Uh, they will be sh 
locked up, uh, deprived of light. Uh, they will, of course, produce uh, milk and uh, uh, meat, but I don't know that this is the kind of future we aspire to and the kind of uh, environmental and ecological protection that we aspire to. So there, there is no magic wand. There is no miracle uh, solution in this situation and in this debate. If we really want things to change, well, we have to be willing to discuss how can we change our lifestyles. And if we're not willing to change our lifestyles, then we will continue consuming excessively. And our society is basically uh, producing <laughs> its own uh, doom. So that's pretty much the, the foundation of my proposal. And what I'm concerned about in, in democracy is not that there are differences of opinion, whether you're from the left or the right. Most politicians, when they make a speech, when they suggest something new, they say, well, we have an idea, we have an agenda. And if we have the majority, then we'll make it work. You won't find any political party or political movement that will say, we have an idea and we want to follow this path. For example, we know that if we want to foster uh, ecological transition, if we want to refashion democracy, build a new Europe, we know that this is risky, that we're taking a risk. And why would we take such a risk? Because, well, a political project uh, is never guaranteed 100%. You don't have a, an all-risk insurance. If you invest in energy savings and renewable energy, if you decide to give up nuclear power, we could lay the foundations of a society that is more modern from an ecological standpoint. But we know that such a shift does uh, comprise risks. And if you're willing to vote for us, well, then you have to shoulder with us this responsibility of taking such risks. But you also have to realize that others take other types of risks. You can't choose between risk or no risk. When you go to the polls, you choose between different types of risks. And then, well, you have to shoulder your responsibility and you have to agree to be accountable for your choice. And well, debates within the European Parliament, within Europe, are fascinating. You have this uh, divide between the left and the right, but often this traditional divide is meaningless. You have people on the left who are for nuclear power or against, and people on the right who are for nuclear power and others on the right who are against. So this divide is somewhat meaningless today. Who is a better champion of freedom? Chavez, Castro, China to the left, or, well, look at how many European countries are now treating the Roma. So if you look to the right, uh, the NSA, it's hard to say whether on the left or the right uh, there is better protection for human rights. And if you take the example of Europe, well, you have Eurosceptics both on the left and on the right so on and so forth. So I think we really need to rethink, to reinvent politics. And in my opinion, Europe would be a good way to go about it. Your questions, please, or comments? Please. Thank you. Bonjour, Monsieur Con -Bendit. Good evening, Mr. Conbendit. Well, I think you're preaching to people who are already convinced of what you say. We are generally European civil servants and very committed to Europe. But the problem is that we're being told that to reconquer our sovereignty, uh, well, we encourage people to vote, go to the polls uh, for local elections, uh, national elections, general elections, so as to conquer some power again. So is that not perhaps where the pitfall lies. Uh, there's not enough debate as to the very meaning of democracy. 33 years ago, 
You had a debate with Cornelius Castoriadis in uh, Louvain La Neuve. You were discussing the topic of ecology and autonomy. Were you there? No, I was a bit young still, but I can imagine this debate. And you mentioned at the time the topic of federalism, a word you did not mention today, perhaps uh, deliberately. And we are well aware of your efforts within your party, of ecology, and to um, devise a new model of politics. Well, Mr. kuhn says that that was a failure. Well, I hoped not to put it in such words, but I have a question. How can you explain the fact that at a time when our society seems to aspire to more autonomy, more self-sufficiency, and people also seem to aspire to greater autonomy. How can you explain the fact that in politics, it's really a time in which there is very little autonomy? How can you explain this contradiction? People still entertain the illusion that democracy is a synonymous with elections and voting. And my second question is, do you sincerely believe that the Council of Europe can undertake something credible in this field, for example, via the World Forum for Democracy that will take place next week, as you surely know, or via the Parliamentary Assembly or such debates. Do you think that uh, the Council of Europe can undertake something and be credible, or even yourself, 33 years on? Well, I believe that we are living in very complex, very difficult times. And in our societies, citizens are dealing with um, an idea of autonomy that tends to be rather individualistic. I will defend. Uh, my prerogatives. What is lacking is greater legitimacy and an aspiration to try to foster the general interest, the public interest. That's what we would need at the national level to try to identify proposals that would enhance the general interest. Uh, let me take two examples. And it, well, it's not really my cup of tea politically, but after uh, the events of Fukushima, the catastrophe, well, shortly after Fukushima, all political parties in France basically continued to say what they had in the past. Of course, the Green Party said, well, that cat catastrophe clearly attests to what we have been saying. But then others said, well, no, we have no risk uh, in France. We have all necessary guarantees. But then others would mention Chernobyl, uh, to which some would respond, yes, well, but uh, they still had very antiquated equipment. But you can't say that Japan had antiquated equipment, since they always have cutting edge equipment in Japan. So the fact that Japan was not able to uh, predict that uh, this uh, far-reaching earthquake and uh, the speed of the tsunami, they, they couldn't predict. They were not able to predict that uh, the disaster would be so far-reaching. And yet, uh, nothing changed in France, or hardly anything. In Germany, well, the chancellor. You have a chancellor. You also have a minister, minister of the environment, Rutgen, uh, at the time. And you could tell that he was giving a television interview. You could tell he was uncomfortable. And he said, well, in my opinion, Fukushima radically changes things. A week ago, I would have said, it's impossible. It will never happen in our country. But today, no one can safely say that a nuclear accident is impossible or out of the question. 
And then a few weeks later, the chancellor went and spoke before the Bundestag. She had been elected to um, put an end to, or she had been elected rather to preserve nuclear power. And yet she said, and this is quite noteworthy, she said, I was wrong. It was a mistake to uh, want to give up nuclear power. Perhaps we have to go about it differently. But I was wrong. And so I commend uh, her political courage and the fact that she was willing to adapt to a new reality. In France today, I'd say that generally across the board, uh, politicians seem to suffer from amnesia. You can, of course, be against this new echo tax. But Ségolène Royal, who uh, was Minister of the Environment and advocated the echo tax at the time, now she says exactly the opposite. That's not credible. You can also be against the reform of uh, school schedules, but the minister uh, from the right who criticizes the reform today had suggested it in the past because France uh, is unique when it comes to its uh, school schedules. So there aren't any politicians who just will calmly discuss the issue and say, in fact, that's not really the core problem today. Germany has created 200 or 300,000 jobs uh, thanks to its uh, budgetary and ecological reform. So we need to tell people the truth, but we don't. And uh, there's a widespread malaise. And I don't think people are demanding autonomy or self-sufficiency. They are rather counting on they're dependent. It's a tradition in France, relying on the state. And that in itself is truly problematic. Uh, they turn to the state, asking the state to save jobs, to provide jobs. But we have to think about what the future will look like and what will be the economic landscape, the industrial landscape. I'm convinced that in politics, things change when politicians are capable of uniting, of bringing people together. And I think the most striking example, and I will conclude with this, the most striking example is that of de Gaulle. De Gaulle and the Cinquième République, well, he wanted uh, Algeria to remain French. And that's why people turned to de Gaulle at the outset. But, well, in 1962, de Gaulle recognized that it was quixotic uh, to uh, keep Algeria within France was uh, just a recipe for disaster. And so he decided to make peace with Algeria. And at the outset, uh, political parties, both to the left and to the right, criticized him. And the same is true in Europe today. What is really lacking in the political arena is or are some political figures who are willing to uh, speak out, who uh, really believe in greater autonomy and self-sufficiency. Europe is really the only political space that can guarantee autonomy. What does autonomy mean? It means the freedom to choose, freedom of choice. And that's what is at stake in 30 years from now. Will Europeans still have a say in the way in which the world is organized and will still be able to champion their ideas, uh, their principles as to social policy and cultural policy. There are many debates, as you know, regarding the cultural exception, what lies, what underpins 
these uh, debates. Uh, let's talk about cinema. Cinema reflects uh, the dreams and aspirations of society. All of society, uh, from children to the elderly, well, our dreams are reflected by movies and the cinema. And if there's only one kind of uh, cinema, Hollywood cinema, I'm not saying that uh, all Hollywood movies are of poor quality, on the contrary, but still, it reflects one particular vision of the world. And if that's all we have, uh, that's, uh, again, uh, a collapse of the democratic ideal, because it's only one-dimensional, rather than being pluridimensional. So defending variety in cinema, European cinema, is defending the diversity of dreams, the diversity of humankind, and hence defending uh, the, the wealth of our planet. And that's what we need to do, is to uh, conquer or capture our autonomy again. If you think of Grimm, Perrault, fairy tales for children, they are European. And for most small children today, well, they think of Walt Disney. They don't think of uh, these fairy tales as being European. And again, uh, Walt Disney movies reflect a different vision, different aesthetics, or take other uh, American directors, Spielberg, for example, uh, Schindler's List. Well, it described European history, so a European director should have made that movie rather than an American. So when you speak of cultural diversity and the cultural exception, what uh, it really amounts to is cultural autonomy and different types of cultural autonomy. Well, needless to say, uh, everything you said was uh, uh, extremely stimulating. I'd like to just uh, put a couple of questions. And uh, if you like, it's uh, based on the actual name of the conference, the whole issue of uh, uh, cultural uh, identity. So I'm trying to be a bit provocative. How come the uh, French and the uh, Germans, and indeed all uh, European nations, should replace their own uh, nationalisms, supplant that by uh, a European uh, type of uh, nationalism? Uh, well, I don't know whether you ever go to France often. The French aren't all that happy at the moment. And it's not just because they lost 2-0 in Kiev. Uh, second point is that you mentioned the United States as an example. Well, it's a very uh, interesting uh, comparison. If you think about the Federalist uh, history of the United States, basically powers being uh, devolved to the center from federal level, and then there was the Civil War and so on. Now, do you think that if things move in that way in Europe, we might end up having a sort of a second type of Soviet Union or an imperialistic Europe? In which case, what happens to the diversity you've been talking about? A microphone for the speaker, please. Thank you. Well, first of all, I am not expecting anybody to throw away their nationality. I'm not asking anybody to do that. All I'm saying today is that in today's world, identities are multi-layered. Okay, one person's a man, one's a woman. There are two different identities already. I don't know whether you're Polish or Austrian, doesn't matter. But you already have two differences there, men, women. You might be gay, hetero, or nothing at all. Three identities. But of course, they are determinant for you in your daily living. Your nationality doesn't come into the picture. You might be unemployed or be running a business. That determines your identity, and so on and so forth. Let me give you another example. 
So this is a point that you made a little too late in the day, if I can be blunt about it, gent so just imagine that uh, at the time of Erasmus, this was a young uh, Dutchman of Turkish origin, living and working in the Netherlands, studying law, st studied uh, Erasmus in Montpellier, and met a young, uh, a young North African lady studying medicine in Montpellier, and they met in a bar in Montpellier. They fell in love with each other, and they got married, they had a child. So what is that child? Turkish, Dutch, French, North African, will give them the possibility, if they want that possibility, to choose European citizenship. I don't think you want to make things difficult for the child. Let me give you another example. I'm, I'm dreaming of a proposal, namely that every year one million Europeans would be able to spend a year working or studying in another European state. Now, it's a statement of the obvious, who let you know, someone doing simple mathematical studies, he might say, if you have one million Europeans spending a year between the age of, let's say, 18 and 14, one full year in another European state, you might be lucky enough, at least 20 or 30 percent of you might be lucky enough to fall in love. So every year you're going to have patchwork uh, families, 300,000 patchwork families, which will also have children. So what are they going to be? So if Europe is to fling its doors open, that means that we need slowly but surely to move beyond, to transcend our national uh, space for emotional reasons. So I'm not asking anybody to be a nationalist. You know, tomorrow evening I'll be only too happy for the French team to get its qualification. Uh, my own son uh, is uh, uh, rooting for uh, 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 France, another one is rooting for Brazil. It doesn't matter. That's not the issue. You know, this whole business about post-Soviet uh, type of Europe, for heaven's sake, no. You cannot compare the European Union with Moscow. That is frankly disgusting. If, you know, that's what uh, uh, Russian imperialism was all about, there wouldn't have been concentration camps, gulags, and that sort of thing. So for heaven's sake, be uh, realistic, be down to earth. Europe is trying to create a democratic rule, to evolve a democratic space, to evolve rules. No, I'm not in favour of a referendum to leave Europe. If the British want to leave, let them, let them leave, but stop blackmailing us. You know, it's like when you have a couple, when one of the members of the couple says, if you don't stop bothering me, I'll commit suicide. And that's what the British are doing. Unless you do what we want you to do, we'll leave. OK, inshallah, leave, go. You know, at one point in time, the United Kingdom needs to decide whether they simply want to be the 51st state of the United States or stay in the European Union. But you can't have it both ways. Well, universal is the local without walls in between. As a philosopher said, the problem I have with what you said, Mr. Cohn-Bendit, is that for millions of people on the European uh, continent, accepting multiple identities as you have defined them, 
people still feel at home in the national context. They have a language, they live in a territory, uh, they have roots, and incidentally, you know, you talk about the Americans, this was a country which was created in 1792, but this is nonetheless a, a country which has 2,000 years of history. So over a very long period, uh, things have changed. So I think you cannot simply uh, say that the American model is going to be reproducible everybody else. We're dealing with people who, for good or bad reasons, consider that their heritage is rooted in where they live. Another point is that uh, how... Don't simply say that I'm a europhobe or eurosceptic. No, I haven't said anything like that yet. Just to forewarn you. Okay, well, let me say what I have to say, and you can have your say as well. Anyway, how can you imagine a post-national democracy unless citizens are aware that they share a common territory? Secondly, if that common territory is not delineated by a common imagination, so there are lots of citizens of the European Union who in their day-to-day -day concrete living consider that the European Union is not a space where they feel at home. Just put the question to the Spaniards, uh, Greeks or whatever, and then you didn't answer a colleague's question, what about the Council of Europe? Can they be of any help? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Well, I'll try to answer that question now. I'm not denying that everything you've said seems a statement of the obvious. But I'm trying to understand how a democracy can evolve. Now, you seem to be French, so let me take us back to the French Revolution. If you speak to the political establishment in uh, France, left or right for that matter, everything goes back to the French Revolution. That's the foundation. Uh, the creation of the French Republic so, okay, France, the Republic, the French Revolution, when did France really become a genuine democracy? It, not just a republic, but a real democracy. So, I'm trying to be provocative again. And I think it took about 150 years from 1789. It only evolved into a genuine democracy 150 uh, years later women were entitled to vote only in 1945, and Turkey gave women the vote 30 years earlier. Anyway, that's not a big problem. But if you look at the definition of equality between citizens in relation to the right to vote, which means the right to participate in democracy, it took 150 years to reach that point. So, if you look at the history of Europe, you're quite right, 50 years is nothing. Europe was also about four centuries of massacres, four centuries of massacres organized by nation states. Nach Paris, nach Berlin. Uh, it's, we're going to be commemorating the 100th anniversary of the First World War next year. That was how they saw uh, nationality. So if something has really been achieved by Europe that was unthinkable before the First World War, that's already not too bad. We might have avoided a Second World War. Why was it not possible? For the simple reason. that The fact that Germany, Nazi Germany was defeated in 1945 and the defeat of the colonial states France and the United Kingdom, led to a situation which no 
European state could contemplate trying to exercise hegemony in Europe in the 1950s. N Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, they had a European project, but that's not what we're talking about. The fact of the matter is, once there was no longer that possibility of being an overlord of hegemony over the whole of Europe, Europe had to be rethought. It started with the, the st coal and steel community, which you're more familiar than I am with. But it was the shock, if you like, the trauma of the German reunification, which again posed the problem of what Europe might be. When François Mitterrand went to Berlin and subsequently, after the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, went to uh, Berlin, he considered it was impossible for uh, the two states to become one because for there to be one unitary Germany in the center of Europe, this was going to compromise uh, the unity of all the peoples in Europe because he realized that you cannot prevent a people from being unified even with the history of Germany as it was. So he spoke to his pal Helmut uh, during the negotiations. Uh, the unification of Germany had to be accepted by the four guarantor states, Russia, the United States, Germany and France, it had to be endorsed legally by those four states. And they said, we can only accept reunification of Germany if Europe is developed much further. And this, of course, led to the single European currency, the euro. The euro was not based on a purely economic decision. It was a political decision of extreme importance. The idea was to destroy the fear of a great many Europeans concerning Germany dominating Europe again. So, you know, the, the people who signed the Maastricht Treaty were Marxists who were actually not aware that they were going to uh, be Marxists. Of course, Marx got it wrong and they got it wrong. The, the superstructure was not developed immediately after Maastricht, and that's where the problem arises. But you're quite right. People say, oh, well, we have a common currency, but there's no demo democratic governance or management to back this up. Well, you're quite right. There are two possibilities now. Either we go back to the past, but, you know, once you've made an omelette, you can't make eggs again from that omelette. You've got an omelette, you're stuck with it. Or else... I say yes, the question that you, you put, oh, who knows what might happen over the next uh, 50 years, but we, we know that this uh, democratic Europe will not happen overnight, but I think that we need to look at, at this in the longer term. That's because citizens, we need to learn about local democracy, we need to know about national democracy, as well as the post-national form of democracy. In all this debate about the regulating the banks, it's not an easy thing to achieve. Only two years ago, Germany was saying, oh no, we cannot have European regulation of banks. This is something that has to be done at national level. Germans supervise Germans and so on. But then we realized that it simply didn't work. Banks are by nature transnational, so national supervision is quite meaningless. So consequently, we are now in the business of constructing something new. But unfortunately, where there is no democratic oversight, well, you're quite right, you mentioned Greece. The Greeks don't want to leave the European Union. They don't want to drop the euro, but they want democratic oversight on the basis of the Troika. Fair enough, you're quite right. But it's one thing to say they don't want Europe. It's a quite different matter to say they want a Europe where they will have their say. So, you know, the, the policy pursued by the Troika, 
which is quite crazy. Well, obviously, the Greek Parliament cannot even discuss it. And we're talking about a national parliament. So this is a political aberration. When the second rescue package was put forward to for Greece, the only parliament that discussed it was the German Bundestag. 28 European states. If each state individually negotiates that plan, you'll probably have 13 who say it's okay, 12 who are undecided, and two who say no. So who's right? So you need to find some facility to exercise democratic oversight throughout Europe. There are proposals on the table now being discussed to create a sort of Euro group or a Euro parliament. I don't know what the right uh, solution might be. And anyway, the main issue is how can you exercise democratic control over the decisions we need to run Europe. So in everything we are fighting for today, it's not a question to say, well, people don't believe in Europe because they are not being given an opportunity to involve themselves in Europe. They say, you can sleep soundly, your uh, governments represent you. This pathetic uh, uh, toing and froing and dithering, uh, you know, they get out of their Mercedes limos, they've come up with a miracle solution, all is well, and then a month later, things go wrong again, okay, back in the Mercedes, and then another conference, still haven't found the right pro solution. So 27 intergovernmental conferences, for what purpose? It's because uh, it is impossible to find this uh, common solution at intergovernmental le level. People were basically concerned to protect their national interest. We need something like this, but unless you have a, a democratic, a European structure which does not uh, protect democratic interests, it can't work. So, to answer you, uh, things are being mismanaged, and that's why the whole issue of democracy, or what we understand by uh, uh, democratic identity is the real issue. As to the Council of Europe, well, I think the Council of Europe is a political uh, area which uh, has a broader coverage than the uh, European Union. You have the advantage of having Turkey and Russia on board. So to explore what goes on in the, the domestic uh, democracies in these countries, to ensure, for example, that member states uh, really investigate what's been going on with the CIA uh, clandestine flights. That means that from Poland to Romania and in all the other states where these uh, secret arrests uh, organized by the CIA were going on, they will be able to um, discuss all this. Now, that would be something to really spend a lot of time discussing. What about integrating Turkey into the European Union? From a strategic standpoint, in the long term, Europe does need Turkey. But as we have the whole problem of how things run, uh, the new agenda we have in Turkey, which basically means that people are moving away from a Kemal-style uh, fundamentalism to an Erdogan uh, type of fundamentalism. I mean, this is terrible, and that's why the Council of Europe does have a role to play with respect to Russia as well. What's going on in Russia? Uh, the rule of law, not just the rule of law in, in France, but that in all our countries, a problem of uh, uh, integration, the problem of the Roma. So yes, the Council of Europe does have an important role to play, not identical to that of the European Union, because uh, the Council of Europe is organised on the basis of nation states, which is still quite legitimate in today's world. Thank you. Three questions. Three questions. Only time for three questions. Uh, we go uh, this side. Um Yes, and uh, Monsieur Klaus Schumann, and then uh, the lady over there. And uh, we take an en bloc. En bloc.
Mr. Cohn-Bendit. Mr. Cohn-Bendit, you spoke about a political identity, a new political identity for the future. And I think in mentioning this, you spoke about the fact that we need to be creative. We need to use imagination and find new ways to foster interaction among our citizens so that we can better deal with globalization and counter this globalization with a European identity. But I think to that end, we need to rethink the underlying concepts of identity, the concept of the common good. For example, uh, common management of resources, I think is uh, a key concept within the framework of this new political identity. And I always find it disheartening that Europe, including the Council of Europe, for which I work, uh, does not explore this concept of the common good uh, at the political level to bring about change, transformation that is really of the essence to create a new identity that would go beyond a simple national identity. And I also am wondering if there would be some space for such practices and concepts in your vision of the future. And then I have a second question. You mentioned the Laken Declaration saying that uh, there are no boundaries in Europe except for those that uh, are the boundaries of democracy. And as an Italian, I am really ashamed of Lampedusa because there truly is a boundary, a, a border there. And I think we need to discuss this border so that we no longer need to be ashamed, as I am, of being a European that uh, defines this kind of border that forces people to emigrate because there is no democratic response to their needs, or at least it's a uh, work in progress only. So could you perhaps say a few more words with regard to this concept of borders? Because the borders do exist. Frontex exists. And I think that makes it difficult for all those who are trying to champion human dignity to identify with the results achieved because unfortunately borders still do exist and still uh, keep people out. I won't uh, be too philosophical. I'll try to make a pragmatic suggestion because, well, there is, uh, we're running out of time. As you said, the, uh, the next elections, European elections, will take place in six months. And you highlighted the importance of communicating, of speaking the truth, of being straightforward and explaining to people that if you want to be able to manage globalization, you have to strengthen Europe. You have to explain the importance of Europe. And all of that is essential. But we need spokespersons. You are such a spokesperson. But why do you not try to seek out allies among your counterparts, your colleagues, your current uh, colleagues and former colleagues within the European Parliament? You already have an ally in Mr. Verhofstadt. Uh, why not some of the former speakers, Mr. Petering, Baron Crespo, for Spain and the socialists? Perhaps also a well-known uh, figure from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Mr. Tchaikovsky, for example. Or, and why not then come together and draw up a, Europea a European manifesto that would be published throughout Europe uh, in the European press, and then uh, wage a campaign in Europe, not in every country, but a handful of countries, I'm sure, that the media would um, 
welcome you with open arms. And that would be a way in which uh, you could communicate these messages to European citizens, a message that is not intertwined with any national interest of any given country. Thank you very much. Thank you for your speech, Mr. Cohn Bendent. I am a student at the uh, IEP here in Strasbourg, and I have a question pertaining to European identity. Do you not think that to some extent xenophobia and nationalism are on the rise because the European Union has just forgotten to take an interest in the issue of European culture and languages? Because despite the absence of boundaries, we still do not understand one another. We don't speak the same language. And uh, this difficulty in understanding one another, of course, drives us apart. I don't think that there is enough cohesion among European citizens. So what could the EU do uh, to that end? Well, first and foremost, you spoke of Anna Arendt. And indeed, in the work of Anna Arendt, She did describe this idea of political space that did not coincide with a national space. Of course, that stemmed from her personal history, the fact that she emigrated. She even devised a theory for stateless persons, a text that she, in fact, wrote uh, to some extent, uh, working with my father. They were very close. So the interaction that you mentioned indeed, would be a tool, a, a means for Europe, for Europeans, to create this new identity for the future uh, rooted in uh, well, the history or Europe, Europe's cultural history. Now, you mentioned Lampedusa. I didn't say that borders no longer exist. I didn't say that European democracy is perfect everywhere. What I was saying is that the debate regarding our concept or concepts of identity, uh, these are not debates uh, that focus on culture or ethnic uh, groups or religion, but focus on democracy. I mean, you could well be ashamed of Europe and Italy because of Lampedusa. Italy is the country, uh, as Germany uh, was also the country that triggers these phenomena. When Berlusconi negotiated with Gaddafi the fate of uh, the refugees who arrive in Italy or Malta, uh, they couldn't care less what was their plight in Libya. The only thing they wanted was for no one to leave Libya. So, in fact, you're raising a, an issue that is not merely European. It is a national issue. And it calls into question the relationship between Europe and European states uh, and their approach uh, to this problem. And of course, this is of concern to the Council of Europe as well. We have to ask ourselves, what migration policy uh, secures respect for human rights. And obviously, it's not a simple task, because we have a humane ideal, humanitarian ideal, to uh, be a refuge or where people can seek shelter. And yet, we also have to ask ourselves, why do all these people flee their countries? So I don't think that the solution is to open our arms to everyone, even if life in Europe is better. And against the backdrop of globalization, families find the money to send one family member to Europe uh, so as to have a presence in Europe. But we need to define a common policy. We have a common agricultural policy, a policy that uh, is quite detrimental to many African countries that creates poverty. And has anyone asked himself or herself these 
boats of people that arrive in Lampedusa. Who are these people? Many of them are fishermen who no longer have a livelihood because of European policy. And their only hope for survival is to flee the country using these uh, fishing boats. So I'm not saying that we found the right approach, but if you want uh, things to change, you have to adopt a new European policy vis-a-vis -vis migration. You can't just have 27 migration policies. And what is quite awful is that a country like Germany, uh, central to Europe, uh, if uh, you, well, rather, they are landlocked. They don't have uh, any sea, so they are safe because, well, no refugees arrive in Germany as their first port of call. And again, we shouldn't lie to ourselves or to others. The vast majority of our citizens really couldn't care less about what is happening in Lampedusa. And that's, in fact, where the problem lies. Because, uh, well, we already have to contend with a crisis, and life isn't easy. And when populists, uh, well, today we should be wary because, well, they may reach 20%, but they won't. Uh, accomplish 50 or 80 percent. But in fact, many people couldn't care less uh, about the phenomenon, even though they have millions of votes. And who is responsible? Well, politicians. And the problem is not only cultural. The European ideal was to overcome uh, national interests and, and egoism. But in fact, uh, we haven't managed to escape um, such egoism. And there are true contradictions inherent in Europe today. So yes, we can try to foster exchanges, but nonetheless, uh, huge differences remain. In Berlin today, uh, many young people visit Berlin. Berlin is symbolic uh, from a historical standpoint, the symbol of uh, renewal, of uh, a universal calling. And it shows just how uh, odd history can be. Today in Berlin, there are at least 50, if not 60,000 people who have come from Israel to live in Berlin. If anyone had said in 1944 that there would be a state of Israel, but that tens of thousands of Israelis would settle in Berlin just to enjoy uh, more freedom, you would have been told, well, that's completely outlandish. Berlin represents Europe, and Lampedusa represents Europe. So there's this universal calling, this universal character of Europe. And at the same time, side by side, you have rejection and fear. So there are, of course, different European cultures, and even the young people who uh, are indignant and are protesting bring together a mixture of people. And, and alongside those who are indignant and who are fighting for rights, there are those who uh, are xenophobic, who reject others. So yes, you can point a finger at politicians and say they are responsible. But at the same time, you have to point a finger at society as a whole. And there are rifts within society. Traditional Marxists thought that once capitalism would flounder, well then uh, socialism could really prosper and workers would prosper. Well, that's not exactly what happened. So often history is disappointing. And the crisis today will automatically 
has such an impact that uh, it will trigger greater egoism, it will trigger isolationism, it, it's hard to try to become more universal against the backdrop of a crisis. Now, I'm 68. Two years ago, uh, I suffered from thyroid cancer. I'm convinced, uh, strongly convinced, that Europe is necessary. But I also realize, and I've spent 20 years in the European Parliament um, combating for various causes, and I realize that today I need to move on. I, I think <laughs> selfishly that I should leave when people would ask me, oh, please don't leave, rather than waiting too long and for people to say, why hasn't he already uh, retired? So yes, I'm still, of course, willing to, to be involved and to uh, lend assistance, but I think now I need to uh, step aside and the young generation in Europe has to be at the forefront so that within 10 or 20 years we can really make progress. We can't expect or count on one single savior. And uh, thank you very much and have a good evening.